I will always remember three things about the Byrne Brothers Funeral Home. The smell of lavender strategically placed around the building. The sounds of a lost man scratching and banging his fists against my office door. And the immense physical presence of Jimmy Rayburn when he said to me, So, Monte, why don't you tell me about your first time? Not a typical question one asks during a job interview. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Burton, I, uh, I beg your pardon. With his chubby hands resting on his watermelon stomach, his bare dome-like head reflecting the sun which bathed him through his office window, and his chest-long white beard that added a hint of old-fashioned class to his lyrical southern accent, Jimmy Ray resembled Santa Claus in a three-piece suit. <laughs> oh, come on now. You know what I'm really talking about. And I do believe it is very appropriate in terms of how you can fit in here. So please, share with me, my boy. Share with me. I then understood what he was talking about. In their condition, the Southern California summer sun was pleasant compared to the humid suburban sweat box I was used to while growing up in Fort Wayne. I gazed out the window where blossoms of daffodils and daisies peered inside the office like curious children waiting for me to respond. There was a hint of lavender in the office, a magical aroma which instantly transported me back to when I was 13 years old, a time when two women claimed my virginity. The first was my great aunt Irma Barr, aged 60 years old. May she rest in peace. She was my first funeral, and before I arrived, I dreaded the thought of being so close to a dead body. I imagined this corpse rising from its velvet-lined coffin, strangling me with its bony fingers. Trembling, I lowered my head, prayed for her soul, as well as mine. After finishing, I reluctantly looked into the casket again, expecting this grim cadaver to claim my adolescent form. But nothing happened. Aunt Irma still remained in her final resting posture. I was unharmed. <coughs> At that moment, for the first time in my life, I realized death was natural, never to be feared. If anything else, it should be embraced by the dying and respected by the living. I turned around and faced the second thief of my innocence, Bridget Taggart, niece of the departed. But it wasn't how she looked that intrigued me, it was, it was how she felt. Cousin Bridget scowled at the open casket as tears streamed down her rosy cheeks. I actually began to join her as my eyes moistened. I hardly knew my great aunt, and there was no reason for me to experience any loss. Yet, I felt subtle kinetic waves of sorrow and despair seeping from Bridget, striking me as though I were a celestial body being pummeled by solar flares. I stepped closer to her, and my grief intensified, causing a tear to glide down my cheek. Closer, and both of my cheeks were wet. She almost radiated some kind of welcoming heat, drawing me to stand right in front of her. Before she took another step, her eyes locked into mine, and she told me I loved her. She was the mother that I never had. Now I have no one, don't you understand? No one. Help me. No voices. Only what I felt. And she knew I felt what she was going through. I motioned her towards Great Aunt Irma for her to say goodbye. She did so without hesitation, with bowed head and mumbled prayers. She turned and faced me once again. I reached out, and her long, premature, hardened hand covered my small, smooth one. I led her to the foyer, and we sat on a bench, and she momentarily gazed into my eyes before she spoke her fondest memories of Great Aunt Irma. Three hours passed, and we were still there, long after the service was over. She sat close to me, whispering about every detail regarding their relationship as though I were her deepest confidant, but it was more than information that I received from her. I took in her pain, her loss, her despair, and I soaked them all within me like a sponge that purged these emotions into the ether, where it can no longer affect her anymore. After she finished, she smiled and hugged me with deepest gratitude. 
I then discovered I have a purpose to help anyone with this empathetic gift I possessed. And I helped many people with my talents. So much so that when I realized there was a career option for what I can do, I knew my life was set. Four years in mortuary school and eight years being one of the most well-renowned funeral directors in Indiana, my talents to heal the grieving became stronger until I realized I was a big fish in a small pond. And years went down the line, I met Jimmy Ray's brother at a convention in Sarasota and, oh, <laughs> ah yes, Jimmy Ray. I shifted my attention back to the Santa Claus man. Mr. Byrne, I'm afraid I have to disagree with you. It is with absolute certainty the most inappropriate question to ask a person in the profession you hold. His eyes widened and his bulbous cheeks reddened to king-sized cherries. He slowly rose from his leather chair, blocking most of the sunlight. Only a thin golden halo that hugged his mountain-sized body remained. <laughs> well, first of all, Martin, the name's Jimmy Ray. And second, that was the kind of answer I was hoping you would say. And then he displayed a secret of grin that would have made Mona Lisa green with envy. Welcome to my lonely little home, Martin Beecham. Welcome to our house. Thank you.